Hi, welcome to How the World Works, where we have conversations about jobs, jobs we've had, work, and the role that work plays in our lives. I'm Kevin Williamson, and I have with me today a guest who has um, some interesting perspectives on this. This is Mark Mix, who is the president of the National Right to Work Committee and the National Right to Work Foundation. What's the difference between the foundation and the committee? Well, Kevin, first, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity to chat with you a little bit about our work. Um, the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation is a 501c3 legal defense foundation. We provide free legal aid to workers across America. We've been around since 1968. Uh, we've argued 18 cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of employees. Uh, we sue unions and employers when uh, workers' rights have been violated by forced and compulsory unionism schemes that are designed by government here in Washington, D.C and imposed on the states. Uh, the National Right to Work Committee has been around since 1955, and our mission is to protect the right to work laws we have in the state legislatures and block any additional power that would be granted to union officials at the state level. But also we work here in the, in the United States Congress trying to defend and expand individual workers' rights. Uh, and they go all the way back, unfortunately, to the 1930s, so there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got Roosevelt-era administration impact on workers still today, sure. and so our job is to follow the legislation in all 50 states and here in Congress and make sure that employee rights are going to be protected and expanded. So that means on you've got one side lobbyists who are mostly lawyers and on the other side lawyers who are mostly lobbyists. Well, no, we've got lawyers on one side <laughs> at the foundation. We've got 21 staff lawyers at the foundation. We have no lawyers on the committee side. We okay. just have young, eager uh, people that go out and travel the states like I did for the first five years of my job. I was in probably... I would say 18 states doing campaigns and lobbying and doing legislative work and living out of a suitcase and traveling from where there were emergencies and where there were offensive battles and defensive battles. So it was really a great way to see America. And it's a great cause. I mean, individual freedom is is an important thing to fight for. I feel like I should stop and write a news story about the fact that there's an organization in Washington that doesn't have any lawyers uh, <laughs> involved in it. So that would be, uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's a headline writer right there. Uh, before we get to all that stuff, though, let's talk a little about your uh, your own work history and kind of what you started doing. You've had some interesting jobs over the year. You didn't start as a uh, as an advocate and uh, policy guy. What was your uh, What were your first couple of jobs like? What did you do when you were a youngster? Yeah, uh, my where'd first, you grow up? Well, I grew up in Western New York, a, a little small town, uh, kind of equidistant from Buffalo and Rochester on the Pennsylvania border, with more cows than people. What town? A little town called Alfred. Okay. Um, I live in the suburbs called Alfred Station, which is uh, maybe 75 people. So uh, the, the station is the suburbs of the town of Alfred. Was there it are, named after a particular Alfred? Uh, Alfred the Great. Okay. Yes. And um, it's there's a state university there, and there's also a ceramics college that has uh, world renowned for glass and ceramic work. And you ended up in the ceramic business at some point. Well, uh, a little bit. I, I ended up as a worker in the ceramic business. That was one of my jobs when I was in high school growing up. I My uncles were all dairy farmers, and so we would spend summers picking rocks out of fields in the spring and and raking and baling hay in the summer and then uh, swimming in the farm pond after all of that. And then I took a job in, in a grocery store, a two-aisle grocery store in a college town where the beer cooler was way in the back and you had to get by the potato chips and the cheese and the munchies and all that stuff in order to get out of the store. That was a really good experience working in, in the retail business. I was a circulation editor for a small weekly newspaper. Uh, and that may sound like a grand title, but my job was to lick labels and put them on the newspapers to be mailed out. I can't taste anything to this day. And I also cut the labels. So I have a, a kind of a disfigured finger from cutting labels. For about we, a we never called them circulation editors. What did you call them? Uh, we had people who were circulation managers, I okay. guess. And then we had people who were just circulation staff. Circulation editor is a term I've, I've never heard before. Well, I think it, it combined everything in this small paper. It, yeah. uh, I was in charge of renewals and keeping track of the three by five cards of renewal status. And then on Wednesdays, it would be cut the labels, lick the labels, and get the uh, get the newspaper over to the, the mail shop uh, in the post office on Thursday morning. So yeah, yeah it was fun. I worked as, uh, in a ceramic plant. Um, there was a, a gentleman who graduated from Alfred University. He, grew, he stayed in Alfred, and he, and he was an entrepreneur. And he created what was what was known as a, a slag pellet uh, made up of several chemicals that was rolled and, and processed, and then it had to be fired in a kiln. So this kiln operated about 2,400 degrees, and every five minutes you had to pour 35 pounds of this aggregate into the kiln, this rotary kiln that would go down at the end and come out at the bottom. You'd rake it up and put it in 55-gallon drums and send it to steel companies that were using it as a filtration device for specialty metals for the airline industry. So that's how I funded my college education, working midnight to eight there in a grocery store and a circulation editor. And so were you, were you shoveling? 
shoveling pellets into the kiln? We or? were shoveling pellets into the kiln, into a bucket, then into the kiln. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting work. The family, I knew the family that uh, that owned the company, and so whenever they needed someone working midnight to eight on a Friday or Saturday night, I would sign up, and I did it sometimes during the week. And I used to, I finally got skilled enough to make the pellets too, which was a whole different process mm -hmm. in a ceramic plant. Um, it was a very interesting job. It kind of encouraged me and motivated me to do something different. Um, both my uncles own gas stations as well. And so um, I thought maybe I would pump gas. And, you know, when you used to drive through a gas station, you'd run over that little hose and the bell would ring and you'd run out and wash windows and check oil and fill gas. And I thought it was a great career. No until, one under 50 remembers this. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I handed out green stamps and spoons and dishes oh, yeah, and yeah. things like that. And uh, and then self-serve gas came along. So that was the end of that career uh, dream that I had. So mm. I had a job shoveling ice one time. It wasn't ceramic ah. pellets. I worked for the Coca-Cola bottling company and we had this weird thing where they would serve, uh, it was drinks at uh, football games at, at the stadium in, in Lubbock, Texas, where Texas Tech played football. And they had this big chute that ice would come down and the ice would go into this uh, receptacle. And then you would shovel the ice into this other thing where it would be sifted down into the cups. And they paid us really, really well to do this. It was just the 80s and they paid us like 10 bucks an hour or something, oh. which was a lot of, a lot of money back then. I never could figure out why they didn't just put the chute over the receptacle and cut us out. <laughs> um, it would have been a really, really easy fix. There was no reason to actually have us there uh, doing that stuff, but I was yeah. uh, I was glad to glad to do it. Yeah. Well, interesting enough politically, Kevin. Uh, one of the things that happened there, I, I had a social studies teacher in high school who was a very he poured himself into students very, very, very much so. He was a I didn't realize it, but he was an ide ideological leftist. I mean, mm -hmm. totally leftist. I mean. I look back now and wonder, you know, how I didn't know, but I didn't know. And he was interested in me and I was interested in, in current events and, and political events even then in high school. And um, so he took, took a liking to me in the sense of helping me go to the student senate in New York State and the, the union conference, actually. My stepfather was a 32-year member of the machinist union. He was a welder at a large manufacturing facility in Western New York. Mm -hmm. And so we were a union family, if you will. 1976, I walked a picket line with him. Um, and uh, that's kind of an interesting story. My mom worked in a school cafeteria washing dishes. So she was part of the union in New York State as well. So I probably, if truth be told, when I first registered to vote in New York, I registered as a Democrat mm -hmm. because my social studies teacher told me to do that. And uh, it wasn't until I got free of that area and got into college and someone, I ran into a, a, a guy at a at a at uh, an event and he handed me Atlas Shrugged and that kind of took care of it. A lot of people have that yeah. story about Atlas Shrugged, which yeah. is such a mediocre novel. Yeah. But, um, but the idea is a good one. The individual well, when you're, rights. When you're, when you're 17, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it, it can be pretty powerful. The thing about left-wing teachers is kind of an interesting point um, because there's so much tribalism in our mm -hmm. in our politics that we, we tend to associate with people like ourselves. And we also tend now, unfortunately, I think, to sort of read uh, a kind of mild moral depravity into people who disagree with us politically. But a lot of us have had that experience of having you know, teachers who had um, very different political views from what we would later have in life, but who were really good, committed teachers. I had a professor in college uh, named Harry Dietz, who was, I don't think I'm, I don't think we'd be mischaracterizing his views to say he was an out-and-out -out Marxist. Wow. Um, he was uh, he was a Latin America specialist. He taught a class called Politics and Poverty, and a great class. I um, mean, developmental economics was kind of his thing, and, um, and a really very good teacher. And personally, I kind of preferred the... Um, the model of well, I'm you know I'm a, I'm a hardcore left wing person and this is what I believe and we all know it now and we can talk about it and this is the point of view I have and we can all be adults and go forward from there rather than this kind of I'm going to pretend to be Walter Cronkite and just yeah. you know who was a genuine crazy person by yeah. the way and super super left wing probably more than than the Professor Dietz was in a lot of ways but um, of this this fake objectivity that we have in so much of education and and news you know the problem isn't really so much that there's not ideological balance I think it's that there's um, not ideological honesty and and mm -hmm. and certainly openness and that kind of thing, but that's a that's a whole other conversation for another time. So these were jobs you had when you were a youngster, when you were in high school, when you were were you working when you were in high school? Yeah, yeah. I worked in high school at, at the grocery store. I probably shouldn't say, it, but I think I started when I was fourteen years old. I, that may be illegal. I'm not sure. But well, you know, uh, when we were when we were young, yeah. it was probably it was fine. You know, we were yeah. all it was, it was Charles Dickens stuff basically. Right. And, Absolutely. Uh, was, uh, yeah. Guys in stovepipe hats and uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, child labor and all that. Um, so then you went to college and that was where? 
I went to James Madison University, and I will say it's the University of Virginia, James Madison. Yeah. So <laughs> just for those UVA guys out there, I like to do like poke at them a little bit. I drive through there sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's exactly what happened to me, Kevin. It was funny. I had never had any in insight. I graduated with an associate's degree in marketing from a state university in New York where I grew up. And I wanted to continue my education in business and finance. And so in the, in the summer, this is another job I had actually between semesters of college. I ended up working for a seed company, a seed company called Northrop King. So when you go into a grocery store and you look at those little retail seed packets of flowers and vegetables, that was my job during the summer. We, the, the company came to the college and recruited people and said, hey, you can have a summer vacation. You can make some money. You can see the world. I'd only been out of New York State, I think, three times in my life prior to flying on an airplane down to Florida to be trained on how to sell seeds and, hmm. uh, and re reorder, resell racks for the next season. So my job was they gave you a van and they gave you a stack of orders to go and you picked the, how you were going to do it and you made per diem. So if you didn't eat and you didn't sleep and you just worked, you could pocket a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I ended up in the South, actually. My first uh, season I did, I did it twice. The first time I was in the South and I'd never been down there. I was down in Georgia and Alabama and, and kind of the Gulf Coast. And I looked a little strange. I had my white collared shirt on. It's not and, Western New York. No, that's right. Yeah. Where are you from, son? That's what they would ask me. And I would tell them. And uh, and then the next year I, I did Long Island all the way from, from uh, Nantucket all the way or uh, Mon uh, Montauk all the way into the, the border of Pennsylvania, New Jersey. So I got a whole experience with the city life selling seeds with this company. And uh, one day I was driving back. I, I got I got most of the kids quit halfway through. And so anyone who would survive would get their orders. So I got another assignment and I ended up in Virginia. And I, my job was to bring a white Ford Econoline van back from Roanoke up to Northern Virginia and drop it off. And literally, true story, I had to go to the bathroom. And by divine intervention, it was exit 245 on 81, which is Port Republic Road. Mm -hmm. And instead of going left, I went right which was a good choice. And then I went right again when I got to a stop sign and I drove by this beautiful, beautiful building called Wilson Hall in the quad with the Bluestone buildings. And I said, I'm going to go there. And so I applied as a transfer student, got accepted and finished up my finance degree there. Based on the quality of the architecture? Uh, based on the fact that I had to go to the bathroom and then the quality of their arch architecture. Yeah. Very nice. yeah. How was college? Was it a good experience for you? It was great. I, I didn't know anyone there. Um, it was a complete separation from my old life, which I've decided that I needed to do. I just decided that I was going to, well, the self-serve gasoline thing kind of thwarted all my dreams, but, mm -hmm. but, um, I did want to go. And so I had a great, I met good people there. They were people, you know, I think in high school, you, your friends choose you, you because you're together, but in college you choose your friends. And so the people I ran into there were very instrumental in kind of forming my, my new ideological philosophy and, and how I looked at the world and how I looked at politics. So it was a great experience. You know, a lot of the people in, in our world of sort of, you know, DC, New York, um, politics, journalism, advocacy, their life sort of starts in college. Mm. And uh, I've had a few guests on here. I, I'll sometimes give a hard time to f about never really having had a real job, you know, where it's sort of, you know, I went to college and then I became a college professor. And that's you know, pretty much what I've done with my whole life. And that's not that that's not real work, but it's it's not, you know, flipping burgers at Burger King, although you don't technically flip them at Burger King because they're on a conveyor belt. Oh, is that right? Um, yeah. yeah. It's the flame broiler. Sounds like you may know something about I that. Work, yeah, I worked <laughs> at Burger King. I've written a lot about this a lot. In fact, the first article I ever wrote for National Review was a Labor Day article about working at Burger King. Mm. Um the interesting point of it was that I've had some you know, pretty pretty low level jobs, you know Burger King and Seven Eleven and places like that. But I never actually got paid minimum wage. Um, I always got paid at least a little bit more than that, and I always thought that was kind of interesting that I was never even offered minimum wage. And um, I don't know if that has to do with the local economic environment because I grew up in a college town, so young people have a lot of options, I suppose. But anyway, I thought it was an interesting point, and that led to good things. So I'm glad I wrote that wrote that article. But there is something I think, and particularly for someone like you who's in this business of um, taking positions and doing advocacy that in some quarters at least will get you uh, labeled an enemy of the working man, right? And it's probably better for you that you didn't, uh, that you're not a Yale lawyer who's the son of another Yale lawyer, um, something like that. Yeah. So how do, the, how do these experiences, um, you know, of, of working in the ceramic factory, working in the grocery store of selling seeds, which does not sound like any fun at all to me. I think that sounds like the worst job you've mentioned so far. I don't like selling stuff. I find it really, very difficult. Um, how do those influence and, and inform what you do now? Well, yeah, I think the first thing is just the motivation. Um, the, I, every place I've worked, if I worked hard and I did my job and I did it right, um, I got opportunities to do something else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a fascinating part of it. I, I think the other part of it Kevin, is the idea that of traveling this country, if you get out and see the world and you meet people in America, if you 
get off the East Coast and the West Coast and and kind of get into America where real things happen. Uh, it just gives you hope for the country. And that's, I, I still am living off of that. I really am. And just yesterday, I was in Idaho Falls meeting another entrepreneur who'd built a business from the ground up. And, you know, those stories just continue to motivate us to protect what we have and kind of the individual freedom that the country offers us. And one of the things that conflicts with that very clearly, um, and you don't have to dig very deep to see it, is the idea of forced unionism and compulsion in the American workplace. And you're right. I mean, my job leads to a point where my best buddy at home, who uh, when he was 18 years old, he graduated from high school. He went to work as, as at a gas company. He was a lineman. He joined the union just like that. And I never forget, I went home and uh, at, for an alumni banquet, and he came up to me and he got in my face and said, I'm your worst enemy. Because he was a union guy and I was doing what I was doing. And, right. you know, um, that that stays with me. He's passed away now, interestingly enough. And uh, but it stuck with me because there is, you know, like I, I did a couple of C-SPAN interviews and people call up and say, you never worked a day in your life and you're this and you're that. And and even the C-SPAN host got offended by some of the stuff that was being said about me. And I said, you know, finally, I said, you have no idea who I am or where I came from or what I've done. And But I will talk with you. I'll debate you till the cows come home about freedom in the workplace. And somehow this issue of right to work is the, it's the one kind of, it's the one rallying point of organized labor. I think what we're seeing and kind of transition a little bit, we're seeing rank and file workers and the Democrat party and the union officials draw, drawing farther and farther away from each other from an ideological standpoint. The radicalism of the left is showing itself with the Democrat politicians and the, and the union officials. And yet the conservative and the hope of America is showing up with the rank and file workers. But there's one thing they all agree with and they can muster 10,000 people in the Indiana Capitol when we're passing a right to work law um, that somehow if we pass freedom in the workplace, it's going to be bad for America. The fact is, it's not. We know that it's not bad for them. But it's really interesting to your point. I mean, those experiences working um, gave me the opportunity to see how hard work and dedication and showing up, oftentimes just showing up, you know, just showing up to work and being being able to work and being available um, gave me opportunities I would have never dreamed of ever. Yeah. Showing up is not always the best thing. I can tell you about working in the Atlantic sometime, but that's, uh, that's another uh, that's another <laughs> issue. Um, by the way, someone who used to teach rhetoric, uh, your uh, your uh, segues from the biographical stuff to the policy stuff you're really here to talk about. We're, we're pretty well done, by the way. That's uh, it's well well practiced. I don't practice that, but uh, no, no. Oh, sometimes. You, you do it long enough; it just kind of kind of kind of comes naturally. So, um, what is the state of uh, right to work? In the United States right now? Well, the state of the right to work union is good. Um, you know, we have 26 states. Well, we have actually 27 states that have right to work laws in place. Michigan, Governor Repeal. Whitmer and the two Dem yeah. the Democrat House, Democrat Senate repealed it within the first couple of weeks of the Michigan legislature. It's still in effect. It will go, it will go, it'll be repealed 90 days after the legislature signy dies. That's when it will go into effect. And that's when all those UAW members will get an additional deduction from their paycheck again um, that wasn't there for the last 10 years. Um, we're on offense uh, in the states. We've got a little defensive work to do in Arizona and a couple of states. But look, I mean, when 80, over 80 percent of American workers believe in an individual should be free to join or not to join a labor union and shouldn't it shouldn't cost them their job. Uh, being right helps. Uh, you know, we, we understand the Sir Galahad theory. I mean, being right is not enough. Uh, it's good to be right, but we have to mobilize. And I think Americans understand it. And what we're seeing right now, Kevin, is really kind of a resurgence of the labor movement because they've been given a complete green light by the Biden administration. From a standpoint of the courts, um, we've made some significant progress at the U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of employees. Our biggest victory was probably the Janus decision in 2018. Um, that freed every government employee at every level of government. It freed them from being forced to pay dues or fees to a union to work for their government. Yeah. Um, so that's a national right to work law for them. So we're in terms of in terms of your movement, how much yeah. are we really talking about government workers now? Because um, not that no one cares about the unionized private sector workers, but there just aren't very many of them anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're important, particularly in some places that have um, these kind of more traditional industrial unions, particularly in the automobile sector and some other places. But what share of uh, the unionized workforce or government workers now? Is it 70 percent? It's almost it's about 50 percent. Back in 2019, they actually had more government union members than they had private sector union yeah. members. And then it kind of balanced out. We're literally seven million, seven million. OK. Um, and but the density is the difference. In, and I think that's your point, Kevin. Six percent of the private sector workforce is unionized. About 31 to 32 percent of the government sector workforce is unionized at this point. So I think that's their final frontier. I yeah. mean, you know, you, you you it's like a lot 
Elijah's oil jar, you know, so you wake up every morning, there's just enough to make some more food for government. That oil jar refills with tax revenue and fiat currency and all that kind of stuff. In the private sector, it matters. And we're going to see that with Ford, GM and Stellantis, I think, um, when we come out of this strike. So the private sector density is 6%. Um, the union density is much more than that. If I were union officials, and I think they have, they're focusing on government unionization. That's where the, the final frontier is for them, I think. You know, it's funny, we still talk about the big three in terms yeah. of the automakers. Of course, one of them's not an American company anymore and right. hasn't been for a while. But the other two, um, neither Ford nor General Motors is as big a company as the guys who make Monster Energy drinks. Right, right. Um, they're, they're relatively small uh, companies yeah. in the greater scheme of things now. Uh, Tesla, of course, is a huge company in terms of its market valuation, although in terms of its revenue, it's not as uh, as big. But it's always interesting to me that we... Um, we often have these conversations about you know jobs and employment and kind of what does a good working class job look like or a good middle class job look like and we talk about it as though it were 1961 mm. and you know Eisenhower's just left office and, and Kennedy's coming in and um, that it's going to be working in car factories and things like that when the biggest American companies the ones that actually employ people and uh, create value for shareholders and have enormous revenues and uh, market capitalizations are either technology companies, healthcare companies, or stores. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Amazon, Walmart, Apple, mm -hmm. uh, the big tech companies, things like that. In that world, um, unions are a pretty minor concern for the most part. Um, I know there are efforts to unionize various Amazon warehouse workers and things like that that have had some success. So I don't think that's probably, um, well, you'll know more about this than I do. It doesn't seem like something that Amazon is super worried about. Um, it doesn't seem to really have influenced their um, their business outlook and their right. business planning all that much in the long term. It seems to be as kind of a, well, there's this minor, weird, atavistic thing that we have to deal with in some states that we don't deal with in most places. So I, I suppose my question then is, um, how relevant is this stuff going to be to the U.S. economy in um, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Is there going to be someone doing what you're doing uh, down the road? Yeah. Um, or is this going to be like, you know, building model ships in bottles that it's <sighs> uh, it's kind of an old fashioned thing that we used to talk about? Okay, if you wind the clock back to, say, 1940, um, you know, labor unions are a huge force in American life yeah. and economic life and political life. Um, labor unions, government unions are a very big force in the political life of states like California. Sure. Um, but I don't think anyone gets up in the morning saying, what does the head of the UAW think or the head of the AFL-CIO think today? Um, whereas once upon a time, like as many Americans could tell you who was president of the AFL-CIO as could tell you who their state senators were. Um, he was probably as well known and maybe more powerful than the president of the United States at yeah. some points. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that, Kevin, because when we look at the at the kind of the timeline of organized labor, you talk about the 1940s. It was the it was the 1933 Roosevelt administration that tried the National Industrial Recovery Act, which basically federalized labor policy in America. That was the attempt. And of course, the Supreme Court strikes it down. Two weeks later, they introduced the Wagner Act after the Supreme Court has said no. And and Roosevelt informs Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes that and and that, you know, those guys are getting old across the street and and maybe we need six more justices for everyone who's over the age. Of 70. And so, you know, the three musketeers on one side and the four horsemen on the other with with Hughes and Owen Roberts uh, in, in the middle, the two swing votes, they they say that NIRA is unconstitutional. But then when they get this letter threatening to pack the court, the, the Wagner Act was one of the four, I think there were three issues that were the Social Security, Wagner Act, and there was one other unemployment, this unemployment structure or something that was what Roosevelt really wanted to push. But the switch in time saved nine, and the Supreme Court rules that the Wagner Act and this federal imposition of forced unionism on the states and taking jurisdiction over private sector labor management relations is going to be the policy, and they approve it. And so from 1937 to 1947, to your point, that that's the halcyon years of, yeah. of the union movement. They they quadrupled, and the number of strikes increased astronomically. At some time, that there were millions of workers out on strike. Mm -hmm. In 1946, the election changes. And all of a sudden, people look back and say, we've created this monster. We've given them unbelievable power, i.e. the private sector labor unions with government, by government fiat, we've given them this power. And the movement has 
you know, John L. Lewis is controlling the economy by, with the coal and the unions there and Ruther in 37 and Flint with the automobile strike. And so in 46, the Taft-Hartley Act is introduced that would basically say, we're going to try to balance the scales. And they didn't really balance the scales that much. There was a couple things and pieces in there that would say, yeah, well, the unions can't do this and they can't do that. But the biggest piece of that was Section 14B of the Taft-Hartley Act, which allowed states to basically say, okay, we know that federal law preempts what we can do, but the 14B gives the states to permission, if they can, by affirmative vote to pass what are now known as right to work laws, which says we're not going to recognize a closed shop in our state or an agency shop. In fact, we're going to say you don't have to pay anything to the union if you choose not to. So that's the genesis of the right to work movement. But when you look at it, it's the government decree that empowered them. Kevin, it wasn't anything, it wasn't this organic growth. I mean, in fact, Samuel Gompers, 1924, his final speech to the AFL delegates in, in El Paso, Texas, mm. he, he barely had the strength to give the speech. I think he died shortly after 1924. But he said, the workers of America adhere to voluntary institutions. Anything else is a menace to the rights and will destroy that which brought together through voluntarism is clearly inherently stronger than anything is cobbled together through force. And so what you had was you had you had adherence in 1930s and the 20s and the 10s and the guilds. They did it because they could protect their work. They could control the whether it be cigar rolling or, or hat making or window glazing or whatever it was the guilds would do. And Gompers worried about that because he said, if we go to government, we're going to be wards of the government. And lordy, oh lordy, oh lordy, are they wards of government? Their power is a derivative of government action. So now they're not after adherence, they're after bodies. It's a philosophical shift in their mind. They need numbers because numbers are dues revenue. And if you can force them to pay you as a condition of employment, you can do all kinds of radical things and just say, you know what? If you don't like it, don't pay your dues. We'll get you fired. Yeah, It's that simple. You know, some people who host shows like this really pander to the masses to bring in large audiences. We're talking about Section 14B, <laughs> which is not... Anytime you use the words 14B, that's... Uh, I don't mean to put people to sleep. <laughs> no, yeah. that's okay. I get passionate about it, though. No, no, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no, I like that we get into this kind of detail. It's uh, that's, that's why we have these sorts of um, institutions that can do stuff like this that are not, um, you know, we're not trying to sell advertisements here. So it's uh, it's it's easier to uh, have these sorts of conversations. So I don't think the Wagner Act was the worst piece of legislation ever on the books in the United States. I mean, you got all the laws dealing with slavery and a whole bunch of other stuff. Sure. It was pretty bad. But do you think it's economically possibly been the most destructive? Um, well. Top 10? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, and maybe I'm, you know, I, I'm looking for confirmation bias here, Kevin. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I should. Because it is, it, when you, the idea that you can force someone to associate with you as a condition of their job, meaning that, first of all, you know, so if our guys here in the room vote for a union, if three of you vote and two of us don't, we're all in. All five of us are in the union and you can force your representation on me. And then to add insult to injury, you can force me to pay for having to give up my, my freedom of association. So there's fundamental, you know, individual right concepts, First Amendment stuff that's involved in this. And that's what the Supreme Court got to in Janus. They said, look, this is a First Amendment speech right. You mm -hmm. can't be compelled. You can't be held to finance speech you don't like. And everything that government unions do is political because they're redressing government. And, and they, you know, that we have the idea, we have the ability to redress government. But when you have the citizenry and you have the legislature, and all of a sudden you put this institution in the middle i.e. a labor union, you get to California, to your point. You know, you have, you have union officials stand up and say, it's pretty cool that we can elect our bosses. That's pretty cool. And then negotiate with them, sure, you know, yeah. on the same side of the table. So I think economically, the, the idea of compulsory unionism and the Wagner Act for the private sector, but, you know, when you look at any state legislation that, that allows unions to organize government workers in their state, it's basically a model of the Wagner Act. It's just, you know, it just goes right through yeah. and says, this is what we're going to do. So beyond the sort of, you know, libertarian ethical point of um, getting rid of this this act of compulsion, what is the um, what is the positive outcome that you're really seeking to uh, to uh, secure here in terms of uh, economic outcomes, in terms of outcomes about how the labor market works? Mm -hmm. And the argument typically will be that because of the nature of employment for most people, uh, that, you know they they don't have tremendous savings or investments, um, so the the employer has a lot more power in those relationships than the employee does. Mm -hmm. That's not always the case. I mean that was. Nothing good came out of COVID. I, I don't want to really say this, but one of the things like during COVID that kind of made me smile was these employers saying, oh, gosh, we can't get help. We can't, we can't keep people in these jobs. And I thought, well, if you tried offering them money, 
Um, that's that's maybe one way to to bring people in is try try paying them more. But I um, mean, it, it, it's you know, I'm I'm inclined to to like to see the balance of power shift in favor of workers often in in, in those relations. And the, the criticism of what you do and, and the sort of general line of political tendency that, that you represent would be that it, it effectively represents a shift of power in the opposite direction, that it gives workers, yes, the right not to be uh, forced to join a union, but it makes those unions weaker and therefore creates uh, a situation in which workers overall have less real effective negotiating power and bargaining power in the labor market than they did. Now, I don't think you would probably characterize your work that way, but that's the, you know, probably the most common line of criticism. Sure. So tell me what your what your outcomes, what your preferred outcomes are in terms of the economics of the labor market. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, uh, the right to work issue involves individual freedom. It's the, it, the idea that you can't bind me without my permission. I mean, you know, when we think about contract law and agency, you know, the elements of the four elements of a contract are what? Consideration, meeting of the minds, no duress, and legal. Those are the four elements of a contract. When we, you, you and I, Kevin, agree to a contract or agency agreement. Mm -hmm. In labor unions, the only thing is, the only condition that it exists is it's legal. There's duress, there's a meeting of the mind, and, there, and some people believe there's no consideration in that case. Because, for example, you know, the, the classic story of the widget workers, the new worker comes in, he makes eight widgets an hour. The union guy makes four widgets an hour. The guy's been there for 25 years making four. He's making double what the guy's making eight. Pretty soon the guy's making eight. The second day he's there, he makes eight more. And the guy taps on the back and says, hey, slow down, buddy. You're making us all look bad. The idea that that employee can't be rewarded for the additional four widgets is kind of a fundamental example of what this compulsory unionism structure ends up doing to the individual freedom. It takes the best workers and takes them down. It takes the worst workers and protects them. And you keep everybody in the middle. I don't think that works. I mean, my personal experience- So you're thinking about this as a labor productivity issue mainly? Or? Well, not even a productivity issue, but the idea of, of an individual, like my history, You know, every time I worked harder or did my work or did something extra, I got rewarded for it individually, and mm. and I think there's workers out there that would that would do the same thing. And one of the reasons why, for example, workers want to decertify unions is because they see that playing out right in front of them. I mean, imagine the UAW workers right now. This so-called stand-up strike that Sean Fain is orchestrating. I think the Ford portion of it may be over now, but they still haven't ratified the contract. But you had three union units that were on strike at 500 bucks a week, and they were sacrificing for their work brothers and sisters who were making their full pay. And and so it's after six weeks. Week, someone looks at it and says, my gosh, how in the world? I've made $3,000 in the last six weeks and those guys are making $40,000 in the last three weeks. And so that, yeah. that whole idea of the solidarity, I get it if you want to do it voluntarily. We recognize the right for workers to organize and amplify their voice through collective action. That's protected in the law. There's nothing that stops anyone from doing that. But the idea of using that force, again, that's the that's the problem with labor policy. Yeah, I think there's a, you just reminded me of something, by the way, I, I used to be a newspaper editor and we started a newspaper mm. in Philadelphia and uh, we got picketed by the Teamsters because we didn't have a contract with them because we didn't own any vehicles or employ any drivers. So we didn't see the need for a Teamsters contract. They saw things differently, but I would sometimes bring them, you know, coffee in the afternoon and chat with the guys who are. There's always, you know, homeless guys they had hired from a shelter, like one, you know, picket captain. Right, right. The Teamsters can't afford to pay Teamsters to right. picket, you know, some 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 obscure newspaper. But I always told them that the great thing about being picketed by you guys is you go home at four fifteen. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not sticking around till the end of my work day. Yeah. Um, but that brings me to a, a question that I, I I often like to bring up with people who are sort of in in your field, which is there's a difference I think between the idea of Let's just talk about private sector labor unions mm -hmm. for a second, because I think public sector unions are inherently problematic in some ways. Yeah. Um, but private sector labor unions, there is a difference between what they are conceptually and the question of the unions we actually have as a matter of fact. So um, I think you can make a pretty good case for unions that hypothetically could play a very constructive role in the labor market, particularly for... Um, Job training, helping young people connect with career sure. paths and things like that, providing sort of a substitute for the um, really well drawn out career path that people who are going to you know, college and law school or college and medical school or MBA kind of have in front of them. There's not something that's really like that for people going into industrial jobs and uh, blue collar jobs, things like that. There's a difference between that and the unions we actually have. So you can say, well, unions could do this and could do that. And you go, well, here's Philadelphia mm -hmm. <laughs> and let's look at these. Uh, guy, who's the? I'm blanking on the guy's name. The very famous union boss in Philadelphia. We used to write uh, about Do all the time. Doherty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Doherty. Um, just 
Johnny Doc. Yeah, Johnny Doc <laughs> yeah. was not a great advertisement for for labor unions. No. And um, and you know the sort of racial stuff in the in the Philadelphia labor unions is um, has been a longstanding yep. kind of issue. Um, so sometimes I'll look at say um, you know, Germany is a good example where Germany has very very powerful labor unions, much mm -hmm. more powerful than ours in a lot of ways, in terms of their really close integration with corporate management and and close close cooperation with government. But they don't seem to have as um, destructive a relationship with the firms there as ours do. So the character of the institutions really matters a lot. So is there something we can do to um, push our private sector labor unions to behave in a more cooperative, responsible, productive, less destructive kind of way? Because, I mean, when you were first getting into this, you probably looked at it a lot of the way I do, which is that this stuff just basically looks like extortion, right? <laughs> that, um, you know, the, there's a rule that says... You can't fire these guys. You got to do business with them once they've organized a union. You don't have any chance or choice in most, in, in, in a lot of places anyway. You can't go around them. So basically, you've got to deal with them one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, which to me, I just look at that and say, well, that's creepy and wrong. And you understand the bad incentives that are built into that. And I understand that what you do is a way to try to ameliorate those effects to, to some extent by giving workers a choice about whether they belong to the union or not. But I, I just wonder if there isn't a way to, um, to get these institutions, to get these unions to be different sorts of organizations than the ones they are that aren't just sort of reflexively based on, it's not legal extortion, but in any other circumstance in life, we would call this extortion and, um, and, and to take a more productive attitude. Well, I, I think there's maybe. there's attempts to do that. And I think the model that you're looking at, a European labor model, is something that people be, are beginning to sound off on. In fact, there's a movement um, going on right now for promoting what, what is known as sectorial bargaining, the mm -hmm. idea of picking a, a particular business and then working out agreements across the sector that would apply it across system-wide. That's why you don't have minimum wages in Scandinavian countries. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think that's a model that we should should strive for. In fact, you know, the unions have power in Europe because because they they're required to be on a board a board member of, of yeah. big companies. You know, I think the the Volkswagen example in Chattanooga, Tennessee is a really great example of how that works and the difference between the European model and the American model. And that is the worker. The worker is different. Um, I think you, you look at the British labor movement. I mean, those people, their families were in unions. They were in unions in the Labor Party. I mean, they were, it was all one big happy family. Here, and to the point I made earlier, the disconnect between rank and file workers and those that claim to represent them is growing wider and wider. And the ideological you know, chasm is exposing itself in major ways. I mean, 2016, Trump's not president if he doesn't win Wisconsin and Michigan and, and you know, Pennsylvania and gets the blue collar vote from those states. So here's my point. I mean, we, we talk about giving union officials more power. What we ought to do is give workers more power to hold union officials accountable so there's more focus on the workplace than there is on Washington, D.C. or Harrisburg, Pennsylvania or Madison, Wisconsin or Lansing, Michigan or Sacramento, California, mm. because their power is a derivative of government action. If they would give up the government privilege that they have in power, I think there is a very strong case to be made for a union that is focused on making things better for the worker. And that relationship between an employer can be can basically foster a greater relationship. But when you have what union officials believe is a zero sum game, that's when you know I, they have to come this way in order to get that done because giving them more power, giving them more privilege and not changing the fundamental power they already have that's that's violative of first amendment rights and individual freedom and destructive economically without fixing that first, you really can't have any kind of kumbaya and because they look at it as a zero sum game. I, they really do. I, you know, when Sean Fain has a, a T-shirt says "Eat the Rich" and wears yeah. camouflage and says, "You know, this is we're gonna we're gonna leverage these people. We're gonna put them out of business." When Sean O'Brien says, "I don't care about twenty-two thousand Teamster members at the Yellow Freight," and says, "Yeah," puts out a, a meme of a cemetery uh, headstone with the dates of the founding of of Yellow Freight and the death of it before the before it's even dead, yeah. saying that I'm not going to agree to any fundamental changes. We're going to put you out of business to prove a point. If those Every time folks, I hear Sean Payne's name, by the way, I think we're talking about Irish politics. Right, 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 right. <laughs> well, he, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I won't say any more about that. I don't know him personally. I've, I've been following his videos for the last couple of weeks. And, you're you're uh, suppressing a terrorist joke, I can tell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Right. Um, but that, that's the point. I mean, we have a board member who owned a company in Italy. And when he retired and sold his company, he moved back to the United States. He's from here. His wife was from there. He grew up in Chicago. He called us and said... I, I've been watching the work that you're doing and I want to be involved in your work because I never want America to end up where Europe is when it comes to labor policy. Mm -hmm. And Italy was 
I think was worse than Germany. Sure, well, Italy yeah. was really bad. And so what he saw as an owner of a company with a couple hundred employees, what he saw that it, the, the kind of the way it directed the way he had to do business and the power they had over him. And, you know, where they take the CEO hostage in their offices and things like that and hold them hostage and uh, that he doesn't want that for America. So I'm not sure what that solution is, Kevin. What I do know is let's get rid of the compulsion. Let's, let's let workers join them and let's let workers who want to be represented by the union be represented, but don't force anyone into those collectives. And then we'll see what the union movement looks like. And maybe that's the that's the kumbaya, the nirvana that that says, yeah, we can all work together. Because actually, any employer that probably gets unionized these days probably deserves it mm. um, in the sense of workplace. And although the Biden administration has changed that calculation, I mean, just yesterday, they released the rule on franchisees and joint employers. And, and we're expecting another one to come down shortly about changing the election rules. And then maybe you followed the Semex case, which was an NLRB decision from what, about six weeks ago, yeah. that basically said, we don't need secret ballot elections. You don't even need card checks. You walk in, the union guy walks into the shop and says, I represent your employees. And now it's the employer's responsibility to go to get an election with the NLRB within two weeks. Otherwise, you get a bargaining order. Talk about the franchisee thing a little bit, just for people who don't uh, know that situation. Yeah, uh, that's the uh, th- that's kind of the deep pocket theory. Think about the deep pockets. I mean, so the union, the union can hold the mothership responsible for actions of the franchisees. The franchise or can hold them, can be held responsible for the labor violations that exist. So Starbucks is the perfect example right now. So you have, the union has decided to organize unit by unit. So 20 employees here, 25 employees here. You know, Starbucks has got over 16,000 stores in the United States. And they those got, franchises are independently. Yeah, 9,500 corporate stores. Um, and they've unionized about 350 of them. And you'd think that was, you know, the greatest labor movement gains in the history of the world. Now, 19 units are trying to decertify the unions already after the year of the of the contract bar. I don't want to get into too much detail, but the bottom line is this. So they say they want to get the units. And then all of a sudden, they want the NLRB to bless this nationwide unit so that, you know, oh okay, yeah, everything is going to be applied nationwide across this across the uh, the country. And so the left So basically is, you can pretend like McDonald's owns its franchises right. even if they don't. Yeah. So now if the franchise E violates labor policy, they can go to the franchise or the mothership. Think of McDonald's. That's a great example. So the local guy makes a violation of labor policy. Now they can pull in the franchise or and may hold him responsible for that. And they're and, a lot more fun to sue. Yeah. And so if they make a mistake at that level, then you can get a nationwide bargaining order or whatever. Um, the, the penalties can can drift across the entire structure of the organization. So, you know, the independence of those franchisee models, if you can connect that, just like the joint employer, I mean, any any employer that comes, any employee that comes in, whether it be from a contractor or a temporary employee agency, now will be part of a unit and can vote for unionization. Yeah. Those are the things they're doing. They're putting their thumb on the scale again, because I think the point I made earlier, they're not looking for adherence, they're looking for bodies. Yeah. So you mentioned something earlier about, you know, the Italians and their and their their labor situation. And of course, the Italians very famously are not Germans. And, uh, you know, well, they, you know, so culture really matters. Yeah. Right? You know, oh, absolutely. Norway yeah. is just full of Norwegians. And, uh, you know, Norwegians um, are, are culturally very different, including as workers than are Americans or Canadians or Mexicans or all sorts of different people. And I think that the, 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 the cultural issue is really maybe underappreciated in this. I remember being mm-hmm. in Philadelphia where I was a newspaper editor for a long time. And I would meet these guys who um, demographically looked like they ought to be conservatives. You know, they were they were small business owners or they were business executives, and they made a lot of money, and uh, they didn't want to pay more taxes, and they had two and a half million dollar house in the suburbs and that stuff. And you would ask them, you know, why do you have the politics that you have? And the answer invariably would be, you know, my dad was in a union, my grandfather was in a union, yeah. my great grandfather was in a union, and I kind of get that. I'm fine with that sort of hereditary family tradition thing. I and mean, that's, that's fine. That's great. Um, although I noticed you yourself did not choose to become a meatpacker or whatever that, <laughs> whatever that job was. Yeah. Um, but that's not really normal in America. I mean, we're, we have a very dynamic society. People move around a lot. And uh, the people who tend to be economically the most successful are people who are typically also very mobile workers. You know, you don't find a lot of American, you know, business executives or or other kinds of workers who are making five hundred thousand dollars a year, six hundred thousand dollars a year in their hometown, you know, where they grew up. They've all have had ten different jobs in ten different states yeah. in two different countries, and uh, and they move around a lot. And so you don't get that kind of long tradition of well, you know, my family worked for GM uh, for you know since the nineteen twenties or, or whatever. But there are people I think who would prefer that. Mm-hmm. That sort of stability, that kind of connection to place, that kind of uh, 
you know, my father had essentially two employers over the course of his adult life. Uh, he worked for you know, Procter & Gamble for 25 years and Keebler for like 20 years or something yeah. like that. That is not what people do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't even know how many employers I've had over the course of my life. It's been a lot. I suppose I could sit down and count them. And um, one of the, the, the sources of tension, I think, in our economy and the way our economy works socially is that there are really very different levels of risk aversion, mm -hmm. of openness to relocation, to changing jobs and, and things like that. And these things come with economic rewards and penalties. Uh, people who are um, ready to move to a new place to take a new job, ready to move companies, ready to change jobs three times in five years, as, as some people do, um, and who are equipped to live in that kind of world and, and work in that kind of market, really get rewarded for it. And people who have the different sort of view that I'm happy where I am. I'm going to stay in my hometown. I'm going to work for the same company my father did, mm -hmm. and I don't want anything to change, get penalized for it. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't really, I think, fundamentally an economic issue. It's an issue with economic consequences, obviously, for workers and, and firms both. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in uh, writing about Appalachia, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember being in eastern Kentucky and a guy saying, you know, you could build an apple factory here, but you'd have to import all the workers. Um, because there's no one here who could do these jobs. Mm. Um, the people who have the you know, kind of drive and ambition to take those kinds of jobs have already left, and they left a generation ago or two generations ago, and the people who, who are here don't have the, the skills or the ability to do that. So it wouldn't actually make much of an economic difference for the people in this community, except that there are you know, secondary consequences, obviously, to economic development for other businesses and, and people around there. Um, but I wonder if there's a way to, to talk about this, to think about this, and maybe to look at it from a policy point of view where we can take on that that risk aversion and help people to understand that um, what's changed isn't the prevalence of labor unions in American life, because labor unions never represented a majority of American workers. At their high point, there were only what, 20, 35, 35 percent, yep. you know, something like mm -hmm. that. So one in three. Um, what's changed is um, aspects of the worldwide economy, aspects of our national economy that are not driven by unionization or non-unionization, and also uh, cultural and social expectations uh, about what it means to be a, be a high-performing worker. These are not things you can pass a law about and say, well, the minimum wage in Kentucky is going to be $15 an hour an hour instead of $10 an hour, and really um, make a change for those kinds of issues. So when you're dealing with these kinds of questions, how, how, do, you, how do you look at the, the, the cultural side of it and the social side of it? Well, those are, those are difficult, difficult decisions. I don't think I have a great answer. But what I do know, the answer is not government subsidies of um, picking winners and losers. That's not what's going to make it work. Um, I think, you know, the idea of apprenticeships, when you looked at the Trump administration, it was, I think, Ivanka who took on that pet project of kind of apprenticeships for mm -hmm. all. You know, basically, you had what were called registered apprenticeships that were basically being funded by the federal government, and they were going yeah. to guess who? The unions. I mean, yeah. they were getting subsidies for their apprenticeship programs. And you you mentioned that earlier. The apprenticeship program is a great product for organized labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they went to Kentucky and said, hey, we're going to train you on the basics of working a keyboard. Um, and I'm thinking Biden says, yeah, learn how to code. Is that yeah, right? What he said, yeah. I, that's, that's not... That's not, you know, he's, that's that's not. It shouldn't be an insult. But if the unions want to grow their adherence, they can do stuff like that. I mean, they're generally doing that in the construction industry. I mean, if you're going to be a laborer on a construction, be a framer, and be work on union jobs, you got to go through a four year apprenticeship program. You're going to be an elect electrician or a pipe fitter or whatever. Um, Ivanka wanted to open that up to everybody and open up a, you know, have these not, you didn't have to be a registered apprenticeship program. You had to make certain qualifications. And of course, as soon as Biden got in, away it goes because yeah. they want a monopolies and unions are a monopoly and they can't get out of that mindset. Yeah. You know, you just reminded me when uh, Jared Kushner was pushing for some changes in immigration policy and uh, toward a more uh, merit-based immigration policy. I had trouble writing about it, as I said at the time, because I can't put the words Jared Kushner and merit-based in the same sentence without <laughs> laughing. Uh, it's hard to do. There's no one in the world I'd rather hear less from about internships than Ivanka Trump, probably. But, uh, well, that, being, but that being said, the policy yeah. is probably a good one. Yeah. Um, if the, even if the spokespeople are maybe not the most credible uh, ones yeah. in, the, in the world for it. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing that I've actually I've taken an interest in over the years because there are unions that do um, apprenticeship programs and yep. uh, kind of internship programs, things like that. And that's, you know, if you read my, my writing on this, it's a kind of a longstanding obsession of mine that, um, you know, if you want to be a lawyer, you know how to become a lawyer, right? You finish high school, you go to college, you get an undergraduate degree, you go to law school, you go to work for a firm for a little while, you take the bar, 
And then you decide what kind of lawyer you want to be. And you either go work for a big firm or you set up shop for yourself. And there's a path there. Mm -hmm. You know, I know a lot of people who've had very successful, happy, and, and in many cases, very well-paid careers in you know, various kinds of manufacturing work, um, in automotive work and things um, you know, related to those uh, kinds of uh, businesses, people who've started businesses of their own that are kind of industrial uh, yeah. related. And uh, but there's no there's no similar path for them. There's no version of law school for that. So if you're someone who's going to be, uh, you know, there's specialized welders who just make outrageous amounts of money. Like you can't believe how much money some of these guys make. Or um, I remember reading this has been probably ten years ago, so adjust for inflation. But the specialist glaziers who do the window installations in high rises in New York City make an average of like $360,000 a year or something like that. And that's great. I'm glad they do. They, I don't want to climb that building. Right. I was going to say 40 they, stories up. Yeah. I yeah, was, they, yeah they deserve yeah. every penny of it. And it's a competitive marketplace. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm happy to see them do that. Um, but what there isn't is a version of, okay, I'm 15 years old. I'm not particularly academically inclined. Maybe I'm smart, but I just don't really like school that much. I'm not going to go to college. And uh, how do I get from here to that job? in as kind of orderly and predictable way as I could get from there to being a lawyer. And uh, that's where I really think there maybe is a bigger, more constructive role for, for labor unions to play. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. And and I would suggest to you that, you know, I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of stories about individuals who learned on the job. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think if you look, go to a manufacturing plant, for example, and maybe you, an automaker is a good example of this, the supervisors, the guys that are above the people on the line, they probably were on the line at one time and they they did their job well and they is learned. Is that still really true? I think I, so. I think it was certainly true at one point. Yeah. But I don't think they're all MBAs. No. Maybe they are. But, yeah. uh, you know, um, I think the supervisors, I, I mean, the, the facilities that I visit and the business people that we visit, I mean, most of the people, most of those stories are they built this they built this with a bunch of guys and the guys are loyal to them and they've been working for them for 35 years and they're compensated well and and they learned on the job i for what is the old saying Ex uh, wisdom wis uh, wisdom makes good decisions and experience experience makes wisdom bad bad mistakes make wisdom yeah. there's something that works for that um you learn you learn and you learn and you work and you're given the opportunity to work um i think you know unions have created this notion of a ceiling yeah. You know, they, 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 everything's working against you. In fact, it doesn't work against you in the United States of America. I mean, I, I just don't believe that. And maybe that's a personal thing because I had that experience and I've seen it work again and again and again for people that, you know, I grew up in, my, I mentioned my stepfather was a 32 member of the machinist. My mom basically raised three kids by herself. Uh, her her, my husband left her for her original husband. My father left when I was months old, and then mm -hmm. she got married again, and he died. And so it's it's just a really interesting story. Um, but it was this, the decision to actually go do something. I know that if people were to say, "Well, that mixed character, he he got a silver," no, no. Do There's you know, so many stories like that where people yeah. can make their way. You talked about a ceiling. Do you know the story of R.C. Hoyle, who's the founder of the Orange County Register? And no. He had a very funny fight with the Roosevelt administration where they came with the wage and price controls, you know, in the, yep. and he gave his staff a raise that he wasn't legally allowed to right. give them. By the way, it's the last time an American newspaper editor gave his staff a voluntary oh, raise. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I think. But, um, <laughs> and just basically dared the Roosevelt administration to come put him in jail for paying his people more than, uh, than he was allowed to. And they yeah. kind of came to an accommodation, but it was technically, you know, against the law. And we have, you know, some, some, some still some crazy things like that where we have weird artificial downward pressure on on wages in certain in certain jobs and in certain industries which i think is bananas of course and should be uh, should be should be done away with what are the um what are the next big fights on your on your horizon what do you what are you looking for? Well, our defensive posture, yeah. the best way to our defensive posture right now is to stop the Biden administration from uh, killing everything. I mean, the, the National Labor Relations Board, this is an all out effort by the executive branch. I mean, the, the second, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the legislative branch is pretty much gridlocked, which I'm in favor of gridlock. I've learned to like gridlock and, you know, lots of posturing, lots of TV shows. And Not lots the worst of, Lots of good hair and all that good stuff, but no progress and no legislation. And and sometimes when you don't do things, there's bad, bad outcomes. But the idea of new things, the legislative branch is not going to provide that. What's been happening is the executive branch. The National Labor Relations Board, Department of Labor, have signed memorandum of understanding with the Department of Justice, with the State Department. And so this is a all hands on deck effort to empower union officials, to make sure they get more bodies, not necessarily adherence, but more 
more bodies. And I've never seen this. I've been doing this for 36 years and I've never seen a season like this where the, and it's not Joe Biden, it's someone behind Joe Biden that understands that the more power unions get, the greater the probability that more money flows to the campaign. You know that vicious cycle. Yeah, I think you may be understating how much he's involved in that in the sense that he is at heart someone whose economic views are influenced by sentimentality and nostalgia. And like a lot of people, he has this idea of uh, you know 1950s, 1960s, the post-war era yeah. as this sort of golden age that was created by, by, by unionism. And he's wrong about that economically and historically and, and whatnot. But I think it's a, it's a commonly held belief. And it's a, it's a belief that um, really deeply informs how a lot of people think about politics and economics and, and, and the labor market. And when you take one of these people and make him president of the United States and also give him nothing to lose because he's a thousand years old, um, yeah, you maybe you maybe you get some more of, a, of an energetic press on that that really is is coming from him. But yeah. um, but anyway, please continue. Yeah, well, I just think that that so getting through this cycle um, and getting to twenty twenty four, no matter what that looks like, that's kind of the objective. The long term objective is continue to litigate. We've got. The foundation at any given time has over 200 cases, active cases on behalf of employees. Right now, our biggest product line is decertifications. Call, workers are calling us from all across the country trying to get out of unions. I mean, I think right now, probability is there. the probability is that it's more likely that a union member is trying to get out of a union than a non-union member is trying to get in right now, based mm -hmm. on the statistics of the NLRB. And, um, and there's been a dramatic increase in decertifications. And I think that's a result, Kevin, of the idea of the radical voices of the union officials. Randy Weingart is a perfect case study of that with the American Federation of Teachers yeah. and and the others. I mean, Sean Fain and Sean O'Brien and, you know, the folks at the AFL-CIO and the SEIU and Mary-Kate Henry, those people. I mean, they're radicals. Um, yeah, I think Randy Weingarten may be the most destructive person in American public life. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, their policies are just terrible for children. Yeah. And, uh, and for bad reasons. Yeah. So, so uh, working the administrative state is something we're doing now. And that comes with the litigation side. On the legislative side, protecting right to work laws. Like I said, it, we have some issues in Arizona that we've got to firm up. Wisconsin, they're going to try to come after us there, I think, and we're trying to repeal the right to work law. There's talk of that. We have active right to work programs in a couple of states around the country, like New Hampshire and Montana and a few other states where we're working for it. Um, so we'll continue to push for state right to work laws. We've got a bill in Congress sponsored by Rand Paul called the National Right to Work Act. And I know that might be a federal legislation, maybe an anathema to folks around the tables here. They're looking at me. And I, I'm seeing some <laughs> sharp glances from the producers over here. But uh, no, it's a it's, it's a one page bill it doesn't add a single word to federal law. It goes into the existing federal law and says the bias will now be in favor of volunteerism. So ultimately, we want to get rid of the National Labor Relations Act and, and the federal imposition of this compulsory unionism scheme on the country. But this National Right to Work Act is really the way to do it. I mean, a one page bill. Did I say one page bill? When's the last time we had a one page bill on Capitol Hill that uh, that would be as substantive from a policy standpoint mm. as that? I mean, it literally doesn't add a single word to new law to federal law. It takes away those provisions that authorize union officials to have workers fired. So we have that. We've got 31 co-sponsors in the Senate. I think we've got 114 congressmen that are on the bill. We hope to get to, uh, to upwards of maybe 200 total in Congress and then put pressure to have a vote on it. We know we can't pass it, but we think the American people ought to know who's for freedom and who's for coercion when it comes to the American workplace. And we think that Americans agree with us that, yes, you have to protect the right to unionize. You have to protect the right of workers to join collectively to amplify their voice. You have to protect their ability to exercise their voice the way they choose to do so. But we should never, never allow someone to be forced into something as a condition of getting or keeping a job. So I think ultimately we're going to get this done. You said there's going to be somebody coming in my steed, probably likely, but I'm hoping that we'll finish the job so I can ride off on my pony and out to the West, you know, and head toward uh, manifest destiny out there. Do you ever wish you stayed in the ceramics business? No, no, no. You know, they say if you if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I got to tell you, there's been a couple of difficult days, but not many. When we stand up for a gal like Charlene Carter, who's a Southwest Airlines employee mm -hmm. who has a 20 year unblemished employment record and is fired from her job for telling her union official that she opposes the agenda of the union and telling the union official she's going to support her recall as a union official. And then when that union official goes to Southwest Airlines and has that worker fired because she's being harassed, 
and nothing to do with the workplace at all. And Charlene's out of a job for over five years, a job she loves. And um, we, we take her to the Fifth Circuit. We get up there. We win the case in front of a jury, $5.1 million in damages. Um, it won't be that much because under the law we won under, there's compensatory and punitive caps. But she got her job back. But believe it or not, she's still flying again, but she has to pay the same union dues in order to keep her job. So we'll keep fighting for those people. And we'll keep fighting for the people that have the courage to stand up and fight against force and coercion, stand up for their rights. And I think there's a robust business for that. And it's only growing better and better all the time. Mark Mix, National Right to Work Committee. Thank you very much. My, my, my privilege. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this.